computer. So you can see. Hi everyone, it's Grant Abbott, and thank you very much to come to my top five SMSF strategies. How exciting. Um, just going through a couple of things that I think you'd probably be um, pretty uh, happy about. Uh, we, um, uh, we've obviously, many of you have done the Succession Asset Protection and Estate Planning Advisors course. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, um, if you haven't, um, if you are a respective member of that association or whatever, uh, we're rolling out um, our next uh, plan. And I, I, so even if you're not, you want to come along to that um, session. So, Chris, if you can put um, up the webinar links uh, for tomorrow's uh, session, please, for uh, Sir Pepper, it's going to be a cracker. We've got all the board there. And we're going through um, how we're going to bring clients to you, but there's a couple of extra things in there that are really going to blow your mind. So anyway, that's not the subject today. Today is about my favourite, SMSFs, where I've been in there since 1993. Gosh, I can't believe it. I'm uh, really showing my, uh, my age here. What I want to do is take you through my top five SMSF strategies. Um, a lot of these have got rulings, um, so on and so forth. Um, so um, I pick up a lot of my ideas from the commissioner. I pick up a lot of my ideas from, for example, just looking at the, the brand new uh, bills which were um, introduced or, or have gone through both houses of parliament and uh, dealing with first uh, home saver and stuff like that, which we'll, we'll cover. But I really mean they're boring. It's, it's good to know the laws. We actually have to work out the strategies for the laws, which is what I love doing. Uh, again, um, going back, uh, for those of you who've done my course, um, the last couple of courses I did, a lot of people expressed an interest um, in doing a three-day course with me. Um, I did an original one, which is an RG146 or a SMSF specialist course uh, that goes for three days and we go into a deep dive in everything to do with self money super funds. Um, so again, um, I'm going to be uh, releasing that probably around about May or thereabouts will be uh, three days with me. It will be online again, um, and we'll be going a deep dive into um, a whole lot of materials and stuff like that. So if you want to get up and, and really um, knowledgeable in SMSFs, um, just watch out for that because we'll be going out. Um, anyway, I don't know why I have disclaimers, but um, anyway, Tony from Animals, uh, Tony from uh, Abbott Morley said I need to, so it's important. Okay, I've got to get super as a sitting duck, um, sit, sitting duck um, in one way, shape or form. We don't know what we don't know coming out of COVID, but I'm seeing some quite a uh, few changes and I'm sure you are as well. Um, currently, there's more than uh, $400 billion, which is sitting in the uh, pension accumulation accounts of SMSF retirees. So they're starting to draw down upon this money. Uh, a lot of it's sitting in pension. Remember from pension, first strategy, once a person turns age 60, you must you must get them to retire. Now, it's not what you and I think in terms of an ordinary meaning of retirement. Um, it's under uh, CIS regulation 6.017 that says once you turn 60, if you give up one form of gainful employment, so for example, you're a director of a trustee company or director here or director there or go and work for a friend or you're a locum or whatever, I don't care what it is. But once you give up that um, form of gainful employment, even if it's only been short term, um, then once you give that up, um, then you're deemed to be retired so that all your uh, superannuation benefits in that fund, if they are preserved, they all become unrestricted, non-preserved, and then uh, you can go and create a pension from there. So it's absolutely crucial. You want to do it as soon as you turn 60, because if you leave it to age 65, if the market goes up, then you're actually wasting some of your um, uh, pension transfer balance because that's just simply going in accretions, whereas those accretions could have happened after age 60 and not be counted in your transfer balance cap. Anyway, um, there's a lot of money that's sitting in there. Uh, that's going to pass down over the next uh, 10, 15 years down to the next generation. Um, it can either go directly out to the estate, which, again, is a huge no-no. You don't want to get involved there, otherwise you're going to get caught with a family provisions came, or you can go directly from the estate down to a dependence and remember cis dependents, which include adult children. So my preference is always to take it um, out of super. If you see anyone actually going through the estate, um, it simply means that they've got really um, no idea about estate planning, taxation, and more importantly, um, family provisions claims. Um, and you can't direct the estate to deal with a self managed super fund. Anyway, so we've got a, a really good package there. Um, they've done really well. Um, look, all, all of our generations, apart from GFC um, and for some of the really old ones, the old tech rec, um, but, uh, you know, post-GFC, there's been quite a substantial run-up 
um, in assets. Um, even with COVID, we had a huge scare there for a while, but everyone pumped in so much money. Um, and it's interesting because there's been so much money pumped in, we've now got inflation, which um, Silly Grant probably, you know, a couple of years ago said, I don't think we're ever going to have inflation again. Uh, what a dope, huh? Uh, but anyway, um, from that perspective, inflation is obviously going to have a good thing and a bad thing. Inflation means that there's going to be increasing interest rates over a period of time, which is good for a lot of those people who are older members of SMSFs and want um, those uh, more cash style or risk free uh, assets within their fund. Um, so that hopefully they can get two, three, four percent interest rates. Who knows? But on the other side, it's going to throw our economy into a recession. So there's there's good and bad things. You can't you can't win on this. Do I know um, crystal ball? Absolutely not. Um, anyway, so uh, but many people have done really well with the run up into asset prices, um, and of course the tax concessions um, sitting inside self managed super funds are absolutely amazing. Um, look, you can with a bit of planning and remember what we want to do is um, even where we're making contributions in the fund, deductible contributions, we need to sit down and plan on how we're going to minimise taxation in the fund. And that's absolutely crucial because uh, with things like prepayment of interest, if there's an LRBA in the fund, prepayment of audit fees, prepayment of accounting fees, all of these things will actually <clears throat> Uh, reduce the taxable income inside the fund. And for, for many funds, um, a large portion of the taxable income is going to be deductible contributions, which just flow in. Of course, it'd be fantastic to have um, imputation credits inside the fund. I'm going to talk about how to do um, self-financed instalment warrants, uh, which will really gear up your franking credits a little bit later on. Again, it's not one of our major strategies. It's just one of my throwaways. You're going to get lots of throwaways uh, for today's session. So I'll probably blow your mind, but that's that's fine. Uh, but we're going to get to that stage that um, we want to minimise our tax inside the fund. And obviously, one of the best ways is where we've got uh, pension assets. Um, if we uh, earn a pension and we haven't hit our a pension transfer balance of 1.7, we can segregate our um, uh, pension assets so that um, if it was me, for example, compared to my wife, um, I could have my assets over there and they're also going to be tax free. So where I've got really good, strong gaining assets, I want to be sitting over on my side because remember two things is any growth on that side um, has the impact of first off, it doesn't impact my transfer pension balance because it's happening after it's transferred over. Um, the second one is also is going into my account and I've got full access, it, access to it um, compared to my wife. Um, and more importantly, we've got that beautiful big tax exemption in there. So we've got capital gains tax and also uh, we've got income tax um, exemptions. Uh, provided, of course, that um, pension uh, continues so that we make sure we make our minimum payment benefits, so on and so forth. But the beauty of all this, and I just talked about imputation credits on the accumulation side, which is absolutely crucial to mitigate and minimise uh, the contributions tax liability in that side of the fund. Whereas when it's over on the pension side, when we get those uh, cash dividends gross enough for franking credits, well, we don't have to pay tax because it's tax free, but uh, more importantly, we get um, imputation credits on that side of the fund. Now, get this, and <laughs> you cannot, uh, I, I, I challenge you, in fact, I would challenge anyone um, in this audience, anyone around the world to show me where in a vehicle you can pay no tax at all, but get a tax refund. So in an SMS, they pay no tax at all, but the government gets, still gives you a tax refund. No one else can understand that. And that's like the golden, talk about Holy Grail. That is the Holy Grail, you know, hallelujah for that one. Remember, um, the Labor government wanted to snuff that out uh, many years ago. So um, they're very smart this time around against Morrison. They're not saying anything. Remember, Dopey Old Shorten came out, oh, we're going to tax family trust as companies. We're going to get rid of imputation credits. You never go with plans on tax. You get in and then you do it. So... Will this last for a long time? Not sure, but Jesus, pretty good while it's, while it's there. Um, what we're seeing now, though, is um, uh, SMSFs are now starting to take hold in, in Gen Xs who are starting to look around. And it's pretty good because most of those guys have got, um, you know, if it's a couple, they've got probably three, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in super. So they're really sitting pretty um, in terms of um, putting money into a self managed superannuation fund. So 
absolutely crucial on that one. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a second. So we're starting to see it more, uh, but we're also um, starting to see um, uh, if the market does fall, I can guarantee I can show you back and you have a look for the two or three years after the tech wreck in uh, 2000 um, and also after the GFC, uh, there was a huge increase in the number of self-managed super funds. We've got the existing funds where the balances are now increasing. We're up around about $820 billion. But when the market falls, we find the numbers increase. And that's going to go to the, obviously, the next generation. We're finding borrow to acquire homes, investment properties is doing uh, really well. Uh, the lending, um, obviously, the lenders have, have peeled back from that. Uh, but there's still plenty of um, lenders out there, Latrobe, uh, Liberty, who are doing a really good job on that SMSF lending space. Um, so, you know, they're doing really well. And the other one, um, you've obviously seen a huge uptick in cryptos, people wanting to invest in cryptos. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, it's just the way that millennials see this as a, a new thing. And let's face it, the amount of money they're printing out, out there, how do we know that cryptos are not the way forward? Not my style, but anyway, I'm a bit old. Um, this, isn't a, um, this isn't a strategy. Um, this is just to give you a bit of a heads up. Uh, accountants can uh, currently advise on self-managed super funds and not breach the Corporations Act. Um, so I just want to give you a bit of background and then show you what ASIC said. So uh, first off, many of you have been shy in, in terms of SMSFs. Uh, my feeling is that you should really go and re-embrace it, um, get up to date with all the latest rules and regulations and how to strategize around it. Um, come along to the three-day course um, and then really start to go out because even though you might have done SEPEPA, you're down the estate planning, asset protection, um, the best asset protection mechanism ever is the self-managed super fund because whatever's sitting in there, your creditors can't touch. Even if you're sitting in accumulation, you're retired and withdrawing money as a lump sum, your creditors can't touch it. So it's the best vehicle. The only thing we have to worry about is being a bankrupt, um, being a trustee um, of a fund which isn't allowed, but there's other ways around that. Um, anyway, SMSF is not a general financial product because generally, um, if you have a look at um, the Corporations Act, if I give money to someone else and they invest it, uh, that's treated as a financial product, which is pretty obvious. Uh, whereas if I give money to an SMSF, I'm the trustee, I'm investing it. So I'm really just giving it to myself. So from a face, it's not a financial product. Uh, but when they originally introduced the uh, Corporations Act way back into so part seven in 2004, uh, they brought a deemed a superannuation interest as defined in the CIS Act uh, to effectively be a financial product. Um, now, they did do a carve out for accountants, as many of you are aware. So you could still uh, talk to about, um, uh, you can still talk about SMSFs. <laughs> I've got to the 60th June. So that was a very long month, that uh, June 2016. Now it's actually 30 June. So you exempt uh, up to 30 June 2016. Now from the 1st of July 2016, there was a limited license that applied to accounts. Um, and really that limited license was, it's painful because as soon as you go down that limited license, you have to be like a financial planner and do a statement of advice. Why are you, why are you pulling money out of retail and putting it into this fund and that? And honestly, you're never going to get the return from your clients. And I would say, uh, look, planners love you to death. Um, and, you know, we're seeing so many people coming in uh, to the estate planning side, the SEPEPA side uh, from the financial planning industry, which is fantastic because you don't need to be licensed around that. But really, the growth in SMSFs has been on the back of accountants. And, and look, at, at the end of the day, um, if you've got an SMSF, you've got a corporate trustee, um, you might have a couple of these um, self-financing uh, uh, warrants, um, then in those uh, instances, um, there's some good on ongoing revenue uh, for um, accountants in, in terms of doing administration. So that's why we saw a huge uh, boost up. Um, now, what I want to do is just show you here, here um, uh, exactly what's going on. So this is uh, from Info 206. Hmm. Oh, sorry, just getting a drink. And remember, this is all recorded, all be given to you, all these slides, everything this afternoon by Anusa. So watch out for that. So AFS licensing requirements for accounts who provide SMSF services, which is all of you there. First off, let's delineate. So if you are a tax agent, if you're registered with the TPB as a tax agent or BAS, 
you do not need a license or be a representative of a licensee to provide advice that is in, given in the ordinary course of your activities as a tax or BAS agent, which is reasonably regarded as a necessary part of those activities. So, for example, advising on the, um, uh, the taxation side of contributions, advising on the taxation side of pensions. For example, if you set up a pension inside um, the fund, um, effectively uh, what will happen there is it will be um, tax-free, the exemption on the assets there, and also if you're after age 60, it will also be tax-free. So from that, from that perspective, um, uh, tax agents and BAS agents get exactly the same exemption as lawyers do, who if they advise in their ordinary course of business of advising on the law, likewise, they do not need to be licensed. Now, when we're establishing a fund, um, many of you probably think, well, I can't go and tell a client about a self-managed super fund, which is correct. I mean, if you go and recommend that a client set up a self-managed super fund, um, then um, ipso facto, you need to be licensed. However, um, if the client comes to you, that's a completely different story. <coughs> so again, I've pulled this out straight out. You're going to get the, uh, the slides and go and have a look. But um, the advice you give about establishing operating structuring or valuing an SMSF must not amount to an explicit or implied recommendation to establish an SMSF or to acquire a disposable interest in an SMSF or other super product. As I said before, that might be, well, you better close down your um, CBUS fund and let's move everything over to a self managed super fund. However, we recognise that advice given to a person about the establishment of an SMSF may also carry an implicit recommendation that the person acquire an interest. Therefore, you're more likely to be able to rely on the exemption. So there is a specific exemption. It's um, uh, CIT uh, Corporations Regulation 71295D. So it says, therefore, you're more likely to rely on the exemption when your client has already made establish, establish the SMSF before seeking your assistance to take the next steps. For example, you may recommend the best structure of an SMSF to suit your client's situation after they've made to establish an, um, an SMSF. So if a client comes in to you and wants to establish an SMSF, um, you've just got to sit back and say, well, why do you want to do that? Uh, more importantly, what sort of SMSF do you want? And I haven't got time to go into it today, but it's like, do you want just your plain vanilla? Do you want a family SMSF, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on? Or do you want a leading member SMSF? Uh, we will be discussing that next week. We're going to do a breakdown on leading members uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Make sure you register. You go onto our site, look for events and webinars. Um, go on and have a look in two weeks' time. I'm going to be breaking down SMSF wills uh, versus BDBNs and have a look in, at um, testamentary trusts uh, through the estate using super. And more importantly, testamentary trusts being created by you and the trustee directly from the funds. So it doesn't go into the estate and being subject to a family provisions claim. So if you've got time, make sure you have a look at that. Uh, we can also look at contributions. Um, under the exemption, a registered tax agent may provide on any tax implications of contributions into an SMSF or other super fund, such as a client's eligibility to make concessional or non-concessional contributions and the tax treatment of the contributions. For example, a tax agent can use a total super balance to advise the clients on the eligibility to use unused concessional caps carry forward. I watch out for that That's this year. That's a really good strategy. And also non-concessional caps in the three-year bring forward period, uh, which will be extending to age 75 uh, but those rules don't apply to the 1st of July 2022. So we're only up to age 67 up for this financial year. However, they cannot recommend a client make a particular level of contribution. So again, you can, um, you can discuss contributions into any fund for that matter on the tax side. The same way, a registered tax agent may also advise a client on the tax implication of moving their super benefits from accumulation to a pension phase as we have said before. Um, and so that's that's fairly important. So essentially you are exempt from that as well. So that's that's absolutely crucial when we have a look at uh, both of those. So really, um, and the same thing if you're doing a, um, a SMSF will or a, um, a less than a favorable um, uh, binding death benefit nomination. And again, I'll cover that in a couple of weeks so you can see what, what's the difference between the light. In fact, I'm going to show you a bit later on, auto reversionary pension is, is by far much better than an SMSF will, um, and then even better than a BDBN. So let's, let's go through there. So an accountant can provide advice. Um, you can't 
tell a client to obviously pull money out of a retail industry fund. You can tell them about setting up a fund, the style of fund. You can tell them about the tax relief they get for contributions into super or making non-concessional contributions. You can talk about the tax relief going into pensions. We can set up an SMSF will, binding death benefit nomination. But if you're going into pensions, the different um, styles of pensions as well, where you do not need to be licensed. So this is all embedded in the commission's ruling, which came out in 2018, and it's current until, um, in fact, 2020, December 2021. Okay, so the first one that we're going to look at um, the, is really to understand uh, what's in your deed and what your deed can and cannot do. Your deed is a set of governing rules um, in Section 10.1 of the CIS Act, uh, which means that it cannot be breached. If you breach any of the rules, um, then any member, if there's been a loss, suffered as a consequence of breaching those rules, effectively can recover from um, you as a professional advisor. If it's done with criminal intent or intent to defraud, um, there's a five-year jail sentence. So know your deed really well. Um, I uh, Someone asked me and said, look, I'd, I'd like to have like a little um, cheat sheet, you know, what's what's how do I know whether what's in a good deed, what's in a bad deed? You know, I sat down and I started writing uh, the guide to SMSF trustees and um, strategy review. So it goes for about 19 or 20 pages. Um, I'll be sending that out today as well. And Lisa, can you make sure that there's a link to the guide to SMSF trustees and strategy review for everyone to have a look at? Um, importantly, there's a whole lot of stuff that um, I do go into in that um, into that book. Uh, but what I wanted to do is um, just bring out some of the, the, the seven key ideas that um, for seven strategies that were built into our our latest version of the um, Abbott and Morley Lightyear Docs SMSFD, which by and of itself only really started in 2017 to coincide with uh, all the changes that were made at that time and also all the changes that have just been made as well. So first off, um, ensuring six members of a fund. Um, so once we go there, we can um, obviously have a, a family superannuation fund. Um, you want to make sure that if you do bring uh, younger generations in, um, that's fine. Uh, but just be careful uh, when you're building the deed through us is that, uh, and the same with the uh, company, um, that votes on the board or votes on the trustee are measurable to um, either, uh, they get one vote each with the chairman getting a casting vote. Uh, the second option, and these are all the, the options that you can provide to the client, which is shows you the different styles of SMSF. The second option is proportionate vote, um, so that effectively um, uh, each, each member or their representative, for example, if there's an EPOA in there, um, you can have a third person acting as your trustee or your director, um, or alternatively, if one of the existing directors has your EPOA, you can be a member without having to be a director or um, or a member, oh, sorry, a director or a trustee of the fund. In that instance, then um, uh, we've got a proportionate vote, uh, which is based on your account balance. So it means the person with the most money in the fund effectively controls it. Um, the third one is our leading member, which you'll be able to see next week, a leading member SMSF, just a little bit different. What it is, is it focuses on only bloodline members can go into that fund. Uh, we have generally one leading member um, or two, so one from one generation um, going down to the next generation in case they become sick or bankrupt uh, or they happen to pass away. So the control of the fund goes from one to another. Now, control is done up in the constitution or um, uh, in the deed itself as the trustee. But if I have a look up in the, uh, the, the company constitution, our special purpose, leading member SMSF trustee um, uh, uh, constitution in that instance, um, all, um, all directors uh, get one vote. A bit of, again, a lot of the leading members or the success of leading member uh, hold the EPOAs for other members. Uh, but if they don't, then all members get one vote. Um, automatically, the leading member uh, inside that fund is the chairperson. Uh, however, they have a complete veto power. So effectively, they control the fund. So again, we're just got to be careful about when we set these up, how we're going to control it. And if you've got an old, old deed, it's not a bad idea to go and upgrade through the process 
uh, very carefully. And we've got a really good um, letter on our site. If, if you want to go down, just have a chat with our support team. They can show you where the letter is so you can send out to clients why they really need to um, upgrade their deeds. Um, another one there is, as I said, we started talking about cryptos. We're going to have different generations um, in the fund. And likewise, you're going to have different um, membership risk profiles, what they're after. Um, so for the older members where you've got a pension phase, you need to make sure you've got some really good uh, cash generating investments um, that are able to uh, fund that pension, which is crucial. You can pay out assets as part of a pension. You can't pay them out directly. You have to use a promissory note and then that promissory note is used to then go and buy um, that pension, essentially because pension payments need to be in cash or cash equivalent, which is a promissory note. So older members might want to do that, but the younger members might want to, for example, uh, invest in uh, property through an LRBA. Um, they might also want to invest in cryptocurrencies or any other assets, for example, a uh, business real property. So we can um, separate um, our investment strategies. In fact, you've got six members. Um, you could have potentially, depends on how many it is, but um, each uh, member could have, for example, one pension um, investment strategy and one accumulation strategy. For the younger members, they might just have an accumulation. So you could run it all as if it's a wrap account. Um, so we all have separate investment strategies and everyone goes and does their own thing. Uh, again, we want to embed that and make sure that is available under the D. And of course, when you come around to doing investment strategy documents, if you're on our strike site, you're going to use a member directed investment strategy, which separates it from everyone else. Uh, bloodline limitations, I talked about that um, in our discretionary trust, our leading member trust and our family protection trust. If you've been keeping up to date with us, you know, we're very big on that uh, bloodline side, only allowing it to go down to um, a bone of, well, bloodline generally. Um, there is an ability at any point in time um, uh, at the discretion of the trustee of the fund, along with the appointor, the family protection or leading member appointor, uh, to make distributions to non-bloodline. Uh, but that can be either permanent or it can be casual, so it's easier to write um, those in. Uh, and with the same thing we can do with our uh, SMSF, uh, we can limit um, any uh, death benefit payment or any payment for that matter uh, to only bloodline. Obviously, if it's coming out to themselves, that's fine. But when we're doing an auto-reversionary pension, we want to make sure it does go to bloodline, which, for example, um, we could have, um, I could write a pension inside this fund. Uh, I might have a mate of mine who, you know, I um, pay, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars a month to just to help them out financially. They're financially dependent upon me because, again, it's this continuous ongoing support um, and I did an article uh, last week on who's a dependent. If you haven't got that, that's our blog. Uh, Onusa, can you also put that in as well? Our um, guide to SMSF estate planning, where I, I go through uh, the High Court, the cases, APRA guidelines, ATO rulings on who can be a dependent, uh, which doesn't relate to um, any document you have. It actually is the facts of the case at the time of the death of the member. So again, if there's continuous ongoing support and the person um, needed, well, in fact, if you have a look at our guidelines, uh, they don't even have to show that they need that money, uh, but they are dependent upon it partially, um, then in those circumstances of financial dependent. So it could go, for example, myself to a friend, uh, but then that means it's now outside the bloodline. So a leading member would correct that because it has to be focused in on bloodline the same way if we are going to direct it through the estate and as i said before we don't want to do that uh, because again it might be subject to a family provisions claim um, if it does go through there we can hold the money up unless we get a guarantee from the executor um, that the monies are only going to be paid to bloodline and not be distributed so again we can hold that money back until we get that ironclad guarantee that's going to happen so it's important um, i talked about uh, financial dependence adult children uh, but again, a dependent from a CIS perspective um, is uh, taxed at, uh, sorry, from a CIS perspective, uh, benefits can be paid to them. So it's a spouse, includes also adult children, uh, grandchildren if they're financially dependent. So if grandparents are paying a grandkids school fees, uh, that would be treated as financial dependency. The grandchildren will be financial dependent. And we can get that out of a couple of private binding rulings that have been issued. Uh, by the commissioner. So that ongoing continuous support, uh, what we can do is we can show that at the time of death, they were financially dependents. 
if money is going out to them, the question is, will it be subject to tax at 17%? Now, obviously, it's best to have a documentation such as there's a family allowance, but then you can't just do a document family allowance and say, okay, well, that means there's dependents. That's stupid. You actually have to show evidence that monies are going out. So as long as you can show this continuous ongoing support um, at death, it doesn't matter here whether it's a retail uh, industry or a self-managed super fund, um, you would then apply the commissioner for a private binding ruling. Uh, we did them at Abbott and Morley for, I think it's around about two, two and a half thousand dollars for you. Uh, that would then go out to the commissioner of taxation um, seeking that the money's coming out um, are a death benefit but because they're dependents, um, there is no tax um, on the taxable component. Again, saving tax on death benefits, but again, we want to make sure we have that capacity within the deed. A wide range of contributions, so we want to make sure that we can uh, make contributions by way of a promissory note. We want to make sure we can make contributions uh, by way of in specie and also in kind, so that if my business uh, pays for the audit fees or the accounting fees uh, for the SMS, SMSF, it's treated as a uh, contribution, what we call a contribution in kind. Uh, unfortunately, most deeds only allow cash contributions, uh, very strangely. Um, uh, for incapacity, um, this is not a big one yet. Um, you will get into it and we will be building this on a three-day course. Um, I've only just started to uh, build a set of documents. But if you consider the case that we've got uh, mum or dad or whatever, um, they're sitting inside the fund, they're remaining inside the fund, you know, one of them or two of them's got dementia. Um, that then means that the people who come into the fund to look after them, hopefully we've got the next generation of children already sitting in there who hold their EPOAs so that mum and dad, the older members, can be members, but they don't have to be um, trustees or directors of corporate trustee. But what we want to do is make sure that no corners are cut, no money is being saved for the next generation death benefits, uh, that we can put in place a set of binding directions. So it's a, a binding living benefit direction, um, which basically provides as a contract between uh, the member and the current and future uh, trustees of the fund uh, that uh, their monies inside the fund are to be spent in a, in a certain way or to be paid out by way of a pension and expensed in a certain way. So again, uh, we're moving contractually for that. The benefit of that is, as I said, as part of the governing rules, you're the trustee and then all the documentation you do underneath, whether it's an SMSF will, whether it's an SMSF living will, which is what we're talking about here, um, then in that, in that particular instance, they become part of the governing rules and they really lock the trustee in. If the trustee doesn't abide the rules, provided, of course, there's the financial wherewithal and the solvency to do so, um, if the trustee doesn't do that, uh, they do with the intent to defraud um, or um, uh, effectively not look after those members, there's a potential five-year jail sentence. So again, very strong to have those governing rules. And likewise, um, uh, any representative of that member uh, can sue the trustee for recovery of any loss or damages. So again, this is, uh, for many of your clients, they should have a SMSF living will in place. I remember doing a session about 15 years ago on this, and this was um, to a, a group down in Tasmania, and they loved it. They actually, spent, I spent two or three years going through that, and they absolutely loved it. Um, BDM or SMSF will, I prefer the SMSF will, um, and I explain it because a binding death benefit nomination, um, essentially what it is, is it deals with death benefits only, and that might be a certain amount of money or percentages. Whereas an SMSF will um, covers six different criteria, uh, which really can never be in the purview of a binding death benefit nomination. Um, so I'll be explaining that in a couple of weeks if you want to come along on that one as well. Uh, plus the SMSF will, you can build in the bloodline um, limitation as well. Plus um, also create this, this testamentary trust, this SMSF death benefits trust that you as the advisor to the estate. And that's crucial. That's part of your SMSF will where contractually uh, future trustees are bound to use you as the advisor to the estate or the administrator of the SMSF estate. You can then create this testamentary trust um, on the death of a, um, a member of the fund. It was being paid out to an adult, as I said before. Um, adults, uh, if they're over 18, unless they're financially dependent at age 25, um, alternatively disabled children, all adult children, if they're getting a death benefit, and hopefully we've done our, 
our thing to show they're financially dependent, um, the monies that they receive can be directed and used to settle a death benefits trust. So again, it's not in the estate, it sits outside, it gives us some family provisions of flexibility. So again, get your deed strategic. So that's strategy one, make sure you know your deed because that's where all the strategies are, but also the governing rules under that. So let's have a look at um, family contributions because we want to build our um, contribution base um, up further from that. And let's, let's start to spread some contributions love. Um, employee deductible, con um, sorry, employee, employee children to get deductible contributions from family trust. So what I meant by that is um, uh, we have a family trust. We're looking at 30 June 2022. We make distributions down to our children. Um, the children then can make a tax deductible um, claim. Uh, there's no, uh, when we have a look at it, um, there's no limit on uh, what they can uh, make a claim for, which is, is pretty important. So as individuals, um, they can make a claim provided um, they're, um, uh, they're able to, to do so. Um, so if we make a, uh, contribution down uh, to our children, preferably adults um, of $16,500, um, then that can be then contributed into super. So if I have a look at it, for each of my children, they're adults, I've got two daughters, uh, Sophia and Tiana, I can distribute from that um, my family trust $16,500, uh, both of them are certainly not on a very high income. Um, so they'll be able to then transfer those monies into our Abbott Family Superannuation Fund. Uh, we put in $16,500 um, for that. Um, it's treated as a net amount of 15. Um, under the uh, First Home Savers Grant, so this is where I'm dropping into, um, that monies can then be stored along with accrued earnings uh, on that. And then once they receive, 50, they get up to $50,000, uh, they can make an application to the tax office to pull that money out for the purposes of a first home saver. It was $30,000, it so now jumped up to 50. So if you've got a couple of, more like I've got a couple of daughters, uh, put money in, it's tax deductible money going in. So it's gonna save you um, a taxable income. Then what you're doing is that, that monies can then be pulled out um, and they're concessionally taxed on the way out and that money can then be used as a deposit. So I, I love this sort of strategy um, and again, great way for our kids to end up getting their first um, home. Uh, for age 70, um, 67, uh, there's no work test at the moment. So you can make personal deductible contributions. You can make non-concessional, you can use your three year bring forward, uh, but effectively you can um, do you know, tax deductible contributions, get shares. So for example, if you've got a portfolio of 300,000 um, shares at the moment, um, you can trans, and let's say there's a hundred thousand dollar capital gain on it. Um, so once we cut that in 50, there's a $50,000 uh, taxable uh, capital gain um, for the $300,000 shift in. So we can transfer those shares into our superannuation fund. We do an in-species contribution provided it's allowed under the D, also meets our investment strategy for that fund or the member directed investment strategy. Uh, when we go in, that means there's $250,000 uh, which is going to be treated as non-concessional, uh, which is absolutely fine. So $200,000, which is going to be uh, non, $250,000 non-concessional. So that's fine, provided you've got those non-concessional caps, uh, that forward-looking, remember, you can do three years out, and the non-concessional caps this year are 110. So virtually it's like two years, it's two and a bit years we, we're covering there. Uh, the other $50,000 is going to be accessible income to us. Um, but it's going to depend on our tax profile, uh, but we can claim a tax deduction for that $50,000. So that the $300,000 of shares going in, and remember they have to be uh, listed shares uh, in order to meet section 66. So it means on that $50,000, uh, we would claim a tax deduction. I'm going to have a look at that a little bit later on, on how that impacts. But again, we've got $50,000, so we can transfer it in, and then we're not going to have to pay any tax or stamp duty on that one. Um, you know, from the 1st of July 2022, um, so we go up to age 75. Um, so if we're individuals and looking at and making a personal tax deductible claim, we still need to meet the work test, uh, but for non-concessional and also um, employment-related um, employment uh, salary sacrifice, 
uh, effectively we can be in a position uh, there of not having to meet the work test, uh, which is it's mainly because you're assuming there that you're working for the employer. Uh, but if we then go down and have a look um, at Ryan versus FCT 2004, uh, Tax Tribunal 753, um, if we have a look there is um, if we've got uh, employing family members through a trading trust or company directly, um, particularly if they're older, just be careful of social security, the impact that may have on building up super, uh, we can uh, claim a deduction um, uh, for contributions on their behalf. But there's no link between the amount of work done uh, compared to um, ordinary um, uh, tax laws um, that uh, it might be treated as an unfranked dividend. Um, effectively, in this instance, um, there is no limit on the amount you can make a deductible contribution versus work uh, performed. So go and have a look at Ryan versus FCT on that one. So we want to spread a bit of contributions love, uh, particularly if we've got a, a large tax liability um, inside the fund. I'm looking at a, a client at the moment where we look at everyone who we can then put our contributions out to, which is really keen. Move those shares into the SMSF, which is a fantastic um, fam or asset protection or family wealth protection vehicle, uh, move as much as you can. Um, again, business real property, the same sort of thing. Um, uh, you can go and potentially get, if it's business real property, you can use your CGT small business uh, concessions in order to get the property over, again, tax-free. So get those contributions, get the love going on. Um, what I want to do is, well, I just talked about someone going over the caps. Uh, the current cap is 27500 for concessional contributions and 110 for non-concessional. So remember, I flipped the, the shares in and I said like 250 is non-concessional, the other 50, I'm going to take that, put it in the bank, I'm going to claim a personal tax deduction for those contributions. So the transfer of those um, shares with $100,000 capital gain in, remember I've taken the 50% discount, have come in uh, completely uh, tax-free for me, so it's frictionless. The beautiful thing about that is once those shares are inside the fund, uh, particularly for as I move into pension phase, I want to get all those juicy little franking credits sitting in there. Even having the shares inside, when I keep on making deductible contributions, I'm going to be able to utilise those franking credits um, uh, to reduce my contributions tax liability. So in that $50,000, how would that work? Um, well, if I go over my 27500 that means on uh, 22500 is in excess. So the way it works is, um, is that uh, effectively that extra 22,500, once I've lodged my personal tax return and the company lodges its um, income tax return, the commission will come back and reassess uh, my personal tax return and add that $22,500 um, onto my uh, taxable income. Uh, then whatever that, that gap is, it's gonna depend on what the rate is, where it sits in terms of that. Um, then the commission will work out what the tax payable is um, on that. Uh, but because it's gone in as a concessional contribution into the fund, there's an assumption there that's going to be subject to 15% tax, which is not the case with an SMSF. So as a consequence of that, what we're going to do is um, we're going to be in a, a position there of uh, claiming the deduction, uh, goes inside the fund, um, that $22,500 is then added back, um, but we have a 15% tax offset on that, which depending on our tax rates, we may not be paying any tax at all. So what I've got here is um, I've looked at a, um, a, your parents can actually be some of your best um, tax strategies because they've got a lot of capacity. They're over age 60, so on and so forth. They're going to have access to money. So again, the only caveat is Centrelink around that. Uh, but if, if my family trust makes a distribution of $100,000 to my 66-year-old father this year on the 20th of June 22, and he contributes to super as a deductible contribution, what should happen? So again, the 100,000, so first off, um, the distribution is getting money out of the trust. And so that's gonna be included in my father's uh, return as accessible income. But again, he's under 67, so he can put in that um, $100,000 as a tax deductible contribution. So the $100,000 um, going in as a tax deductible contribution, so it's de accessible, but it's de um, deductible to that. What happens inside the fund, as I said before, that $100,000 because dad's been claiming a tax deduction for it, um, it's going to be included in the accessible income of the fund. 
Um, everywhere else, like industry and retail funds, will generally take 15% up front. But what we're going to do is we just add it into the accessible income of the fund. So if you're going to do that now, you're planning to do that now, again, you want to minimise that tax liability. So look at, for example, uh, prepayments of interest if you're an LRBA, prepayment of audit, accounting fees. Um, if you also look at ESIC investments, uh, the sum around which uh, provided 20% a tax offset, and of course, franking credits we talked about before, um, even create self-financed in, instalment warrants. So what I mean by that, so for example, um, under the laws, um, that $100,000, um, so let's say we've got um, CBA, which has got a really good uh, frank yield, um, whatever, let's say it's three or 4%, Oh, that hundred thousand dollars going in um, to the uh, the fund. If I've got uh, wherewithal outside, so if I've got equity outside uh, in my family home, I could borrow a hundred thousand um, uh, dollars. I could borrow a hundred thousand um, dollars and lend it to the fund, add it to this hundred thousand dollars which I've just put in as a tax deductible contribution. So I've now got a two hundred thousand dollar base. Uh, from that $200,000 base, so it's 50% uh, LRBA, it's on a collection of assets being um, CBA shares. I've got a good stake in there. I've now got uh, $200,000. Um, if I'm getting a 4% fully frank dividend, I'm going to get around about on $200,000, I'm going to get around about $8,000 or $9,000 in cash and probably around about a $5,000 franking credit. Uh, $5,000 franking credit for me is, is quite... Um, if you have a look at that, that enables me to put in oh, probably at a 15%, um, probably going to be able to put in around about forty to $45,000 um, next year as a tax deductible contribution and not have to pay any contributions tax because those franking credits are there for me. So the self-finance instalment warrants, we've actually got on our uh, system how to build those. Um, if not, then you can come to Abbott and Morley and we can build those. But they are good because you, once you put them in, you happen all the time. The other benefit there for your client is remember, they've lent $100,000 of the fund. So at any point in time, particularly if they're younger, they can, in, in that contributions phase, they can pull that money out at any time they want for any reason. So again, that, that self financing installment warrant, um, you know, I love those things. Um, again, they're very generous. So let's, let's just go down and have a look. Um, so for dad, what we want to do is, let, let's have a look. So I'm taking $75,000. So there's $100,000 gone in, um, but I'm only going to put $75,000 into dad's account this year. The other $25,000 I'm going to put into a superannuation or contribution suspense account. So that means that after taking out $27,500, um, I've got um, $47,500, which is going to be ad added back to dad's income. Now, if dad's got no other income, it's just been living off super, um, tax on that $47,500 is $5,940. Um, and you'll also be entitled to a low middle income tax offset of around about $1,080. So they're up around about um, uh, tax payable um, is probably going to be around about $4,900 $4, or thereabouts. So again, I'm, not, I'm just doing this. Again, no calculators is all going straight from Grant's head. Um, but the important thing here, and this is the real crucial, is there's a 15% tax offset. So that just comes as a right. So 15% times 47,500 is 7,125. But remember, our tax liability is only around about 4,800. So I'm leaving a lot on the table. So it means I should be taking more than $75,000. Now I've gone to the next level. So what happens if we put it all in, the $100,000, um, then what I've got there is um, I've got a, a tax liability of 14, which will be reduced slightly by well, probably one because it's over going to be over the threshold. But $14,000, my tax offsets, $10,875. So I'm going to be up for around about $3,000 in tax. Um, so probably around about $85,000, $87,000 is the magic figure. Now, if you've got your mum and you also got your dad there, that's a lot of money that you can park away. And of course, when that money goes in, obviously it's going into their account, but you want to make sure you do an SMSF will so that money is directed back to you on death and it can't be challenged. And finally, um, the thing that we used to worry about is going over our franking credits, so going over our, our caps, is there used to be a excess concessional contributions tax surcharge 
uh, but that is no more, thank you, Pauline Hanson. So if we do go over at CAPS, um, that ECC, C, that charge is no longer the case. So again, above the CAPS is, is really crucial. Uh, do your numbers, have a look, but remember, we want to go back and spread, um, sorry, we want to spread the contributions love amongst our family and then also go from there. Uh, almost getting to the end here, auto reversionary pension. So check the deed. Um, I looked at the deed last week. They had an account-based pension. It was the 2004 deed, which is interesting because account-based pensions didn't come into 2007. So effectively been running with an illegal pension for a long time. Uh, commissioner didn't pick it up, neither did the auditor. But anyway, um, so uh, with account-based pension, uh, we can revert. So it can go, generally you'll see it go to mum to dad or dad to mum. Uh, but remember, anyone who is a dependent uh, can receive the pension. For a child, though, it's only a um, uh, up to age 18 or 25 if they're financially dependent um, or uh, they're a disabled child and go to life. Uh, but that means anyone else who's a financial dependent or an interdependent relationship. Remember, I went through before I said, could go from me to a friend who is a financial dependent because I provided um, on a gift basis and ongoing financial support. So it could go from me up to them. And when it goes to them, it's then tested against their pension transfer balance. But it automatically just transfers. As soon as you get my death certificate, as administrator, you'll cut down my pension and then just transfer it to the next person. Obviously, it was a friend, they'd have to bring them in or transfer it to another pension. But it could go mum to dad. The only problem is if, if you're already hitting transfer pension balances, you know, why do that? It might even be worthwhile if you are over transfer pension balance to actually pull out that uh, surplus and put it into a family protection trust. Um, so we've already got there because you're actually taking it tax-free, putting a family protection trust, which is there for bloodline. So that's the sort of strategy I like doing. Uh, alternatively, we can go from, uh, we can go dad to mum to adult child. But if it's an adult child, remember, it has to come out as a lump sum as they're taxed um, in their hands. We talked about that a little bit further. We can't continue the pension. Or remember, I just talked about that if you're paying the grandkids school fees, it could go from dad to mum to the grandkids. And again, the grandkids are going to be financially dependent. They're not children. So the caveat that uh, are like children that um, they can't be paid a pension post age 25 doesn't apply. So you can have also a joint pension uh, for uh, those grandchildren that were dependents. The good thing about it, though, is what I really love, the, the two big things about this, it's by far and away much better than SMSF will, by far, far away better than the BDVN is that once you've got these reversions in play, they actually pick up the tax profile of the original uh, recipient. So if dad was over age 60 receiving tax-free, then whoever touches that pension, it's always going to be tax-free, always tax-free, and that's crucial. So even grandkids, if they're like 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the track, it's always going to be tax-free. Best of all for me, um, it's also protected from family provisions claims because what happens is, once I pass away, that asset is no longer mine. It passes on to the next person. As a consequence of that, it can never go into my estate or be treated as part of my notional estate uh, if you happen to be in New South Wales. Okay, last one. This is a bit out there. Look, I've got so many other strategies I could have given you, but if you come along with a three-day course, you're going to get lots. Uh, look, I, I, I'm a little bit older bit uh, more sec, um, sanguine about this. Uh, but I do remember cryptos being around in um, uh, around in uh, the mid 2000s or, or the early uh, 2000s, etc. Um, so it would have been a good idea to get into Bitcoin then. It was very, very new. Um, they went up and remember dropped down. Um, look, who knows? I, I'm not, I don't invest in crypto. Uh, but it's a whole new brand new world. And my, my wife loves it, um, all that sort of stuff, the blockchain. So when we have a look at the, the new Web3, supposedly, you're looking at cryptos. Um, we got Ethereum, et cetera. I uh, even know that um, I know Ashley from our uh, firm is obviously, um, she's, uh, she's right in the process of looking at a lot of blockchain. We've got some amazing things coming down a little bit later on, around on that. Uh, but she's looking at cryptos um, in relation to that. Uh, Non-fungible tokens where you might do artwork or you might do an article or might do a deed, for example. Um, and then that non-fungible token, you get a, um, uh, it's worth something 
for you. Uh, generally, it's for digital art or some digital document, uh, which then has uh, an ability to go and sell it. Um, the metaverse, uh, for those of you who don't know it, um, is, you know, you jump onto a virtual reality headset, um, like an Oculus, if you're with, um, uh, if you're with uh, Facebook, uh, and jump in there and you've got your own little avatar, you can walk around that. We're now starting to see people buying uh, space into different worlds. So there's a whole lot of different worlds there. Uh, look, again, a little bit beyond me, I prefer to have the real bricks and mortar. But again, um, your clients are, are wanting to come in there. Is there any um, a prevention of going in here? Not at all. Again, it's a risky um, speculative investment, but you must make sure the um, deed allows uh, we are going to be building a, our deed with a crypto option, so some specific rules in around that. Uh, we're also going to be building a crypto discretionary trust. Uh, both of these are going to be available in May um, at our uh, roadshow, which would be great. Um, so watch out for that. So it's my first time I've been travelling around Australia in about three years. Um, so there'll be a whole coast, cast of us and we'll be doing some awesome strategies whole, around the whole spectrum of SMSFs. Um, to asset protection, estate planning, and bringing everything together. Um, funds investment strategy, um, you know, details and storage. Um, our investment strategy has I got the space for crypto, uh, but I am building a separate um, crypto orange, origin in there. You also find with our wills, um, we're one of the first in Australia to actually build in uh, the capacity of having uh, the the transfer of digital assets uh, through the will and even having a digital executor. So obviously you've got to passwords, et cetera. Um, definitely need to look at separate investment strategies if it's going to young members. So how, how the younger members can get into NFTs, uh, cryptos or the metaverse going and buying space in there without interrupting or impacting um, their parents, which is really crucial. So it's right on 12. Um, I've got some questions. So let's go through. Uh, from Mitch. Good to see you, Mitch. Uh, one of my favourite advisors up here. Um, what if you put money into Super um, Re FHHS? Okay, so the first home uh, for this purpose, but never end up buying a house which fits into the criteria. Um, so if that's the case, um, Mitch, there's no drama. You can put as much as you want in there. But what happens is when you want to use your first home saver scheme, you need to go to the tax office and then uh, fill in a, a form for because the tax office is the one who has to release it. So it needs to meet all those criteria. If you don't uh, meet that criteria, there's a really good, if you want, there's a link uh, there I can show you. But tax office goes through first home saver grant or home saver scheme. If you can't do that, then you might be able to get it uh, under compassionate grounds. But that's obviously if you're disabled or something like that. So again, um, you need to meet those criteria in order to be released. Another question is, the rules indicate you can only request to release this money from the super fund a one time and need a draw within two years. What if you purchased a house, you haven't purchased a house in that time? Uh, that's a really good point. Um, again, so e even if you do, you need to be in there within a, a two year period. So what you've got to do there is, um, it's more about um, not going and, and seeking that request, but waiting until you find the right place to then go down and do the request. Importantly, Commission has come out and quite rightly said that um, it's uh, one person. Um, so if you've got um, three or four members of the family or you've got, for example, one person who's bought the house, the other person doesn't, then you can load it into theirs. Um, it's $15,000 net. Um, so that's like 16 and a half. You can get a deduction and it comes back. Um, so Clayton Wood, does uh, LYD have a process for council to follow great SMSF after telling uh, clients? Absolutely. So uh, that's a really good question, Clayton. Um, one of, um, you'll see when you go into creating a self-managed super fund, uh, part of regulation 7.1.295D for accounts is that you need to be telling the clients, as you said, as you've said there, um, is that you're not a licensed financial advisor. You can go and get advice at that point in time. Um, so what we've done is um, when you uh, produce your establishment, there's a little button there. Are you an accountant seeking to um, notify the client of your, um, that they need to go and see, or you're utilizing 71295D. If you do that, then a, a letter comes out saying to the client um, that you're not a financial advisor and they need to go and see someone and that you have created the SMSF 
following advice that I've given to you. So that's pretty important. So that's a really good question, Clay. Uh, Clay. And thanks for doing that because I didn't raise that during the session. Uh, Daisy, my friend, uh, can you confirm if light, um, if a light year SMSF trustee is required for the light year SMSF? Well, generally, um, it would be the case. Um, what I would suggest, Daisy, is uh, another strategy that's really important is a successor director solution um, you need to put in place, particularly if you've got one or two member funds. Um, if both of your clients die, you need to be able to put in place uh, an executor um, he'll come in and uh, do the re, uh, act as a replacement director on the corporate trustee to look after an SMSF will. So if you're going to do that, um, you can actually upgrade the constitution uh, to a special purpose uh, SMSF uh, corporate trustee um, and uh, upgrade through there. I think it's 129, but you can do a successor director as well. So that's not a bad one, Daisy, in order to get the light year SMSF will. You can use our SMSF will. Um, if other um, deeds allow, uh, but if another deed says uh, you can only do BDBN, then our SMSF will is not going to fit. So you can't you can't fit a gold uh, Rolls Royce um, into a used car lot. Uh, well, you probably can, but a used car lot that doesn't go above ten thousand dollars, it just doesn't fit. So again, you want to make sure anyway consistently you've got everything all on the same platform. Um, and let's go down. Uh, Mitch again, uh, what's, what software do you recommend to keep track of crypto transactions and positions for tax purposes? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, and if anyone else has got a bit of an idea, why don't you throw something into the chat? Uh, mainly because um, from what I've seen is it depends on what the exchanges are. Um, I have seen um, with um, one of the, the clients that's come in, everything was done on a spreadsheet, which was quite useful. It was interesting because um, that was in an SNSF, uh, but what transpired is that uh, to go into the, the exchange or coin exchange, you had to be an individual. Um, so what we had to do is we had to do up a holding trust or a bear trust uh, the individual was holding those cryptos for the benefit of the SMSF. So we'll be building into this, this new deed. But if anyone's got a bit of an idea, let Mitch know. Um, is there age limit for super contributions on behalf of children? No. As soon as they've got a heartbeat, Selma, um, you can actually make a contribution on their behalf. Again, uh, non-concessional, up to $110,000 a year um, is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, in order for them in order to make a, a tax deduction themselves or claim their own personal deduction, I think they need to be engaged in a business or have some employment income. Uh, you may not be aware, but um, SGC, the 450 rule is, is no longer around anymore. So as soon as someone makes uh, one day at McDonald's, they're actually employed. Um, are the last three and or are they either or? Oh, sorry, um, they're and. So sorry about that. That's that's great. Thank you very much, Chris. Again, you're going to get um, uh, you're going to get uh, all these slides as well. Um, yeah. So uh, Mitch, you saw the articles popped up last few days. There was only one, and that was from Dan Butler's uh, crew. Um, have a read of that, and you actually see you'll see in a couple of weeks. I'll go through it, but they end up um, uh, using. Yeah, they don't because. If you read through, there's a false equivalence anyway uh, that a uh, SMSF will is a BDBN, which is not the case. And so they're therefore, so if you read through that, you can actually see there's absolutely no logic to that article whatsoever. It's a nice article, but it's so illogical. Um, this is from the same crew that when I first introduced SMSF wills in 2008, said it was impossible to do an SMSF will. So I'm just grateful that it's now, um, you know, across the mainstream and into vernacular as all uh, new ideas do. Uh, BDBNs to date, um, uh, as I said in that article, there has been no cases on SMSF wills, uh, but there's probably been around about 20 cases on BDBNs um, and also um, now a high court case. So again, provided it doesn't matter whether you use a BDBN or SMSF will, you just gotta make sure it's strong, safe, secure and certain. And saying I embedded SMSF will, it's always my preference, but both of them really don't even compare when you go down and start to look at an auto reversion pension, it's the best out of all. 
Um, Andrew Morris, in your 100 contribution for data on 67, will the 15% um, tax offset apply to the full? Absolutely. So um, anything that goes, so Andrew, the, the, the way it looks is the reverse. Um, so if you, if you think about it, um, whatever is excess, and that, look, I'd, I'd encourage all of you to really have a look at this. Um, again, if you go above your caps, it's not subject apart for A, it's nothing. So there's ADO rulings on that that I can give you. What happens is when you go above your caps, then that amount is then added back to your assessable income. So that's including your assessable income uh, or you're on top of your taxable income. You then work out your tax rate on that. And then whatever has been included, you then get a 15% offset. Now, the good thing is you don't have to worry about doing that because the commissioner actually does that for you. The real, um, uh, the real juice in the whole strategy is to reduce the underlying um, contribution tax liability by, if you can, through those self-financing instalment warrants, which you can do up on the, um, uh, on the Lightyear Doc site. Um, Debbie Potts, if you do a successor company, res and upgrade the company constitution, do we all know also need to upgrade the trustee if a trustee company? No, not at all. So um, the good thing about it is um, uh, I had a, uh, uh, I had a um, session with one of our advisors just before this. Um, it's very easy to upgrade a constitution. If clients have lost a constitution, just go onto our site and upgrade because um, the upgrade process is built into the Corporations Act. Uh, whereas if we've obviously got a D, we've got to go through and upgrade the D for a purpose. My preference is to go through the both, uh, but um, if you're just using a stock standard SMSF trustee company, um, then you can go through ours. If you're using a leading member, then you're going to have to upgrade the deed as well. Um, now, uh, we've got uh, lots of stuff that's coming down to you. Thanks all for um, uh, tuning in. Have a look at those articles like that SMSF will. It's fantastic. I'll be pulling it to pieces in a couple of weeks. Don't want to get ahead of our time. Uh, but just a, a couple of things. I just want to show you uh, what's coming up um, so that you are uh, aware of what is coming up. Um, so if I just go into, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, jumped onto Lightyear Docs 2, uh, please make sure you do so and contact our support um, or just uh, support at lightyeardocs.com.au um, and make sure that you're on Lightyear Docs 2. It's a fantastic system, getting better all the time. I showed you how to do wills, et cetera, the other day, and there's a whole lot of benefits there. Um, so if I go down and have a look here, events and webinars, some of the ones that are coming up, um, this is really important uh, for us. Remember, tomorrow, um, if you are a founding member or a member of SAPEP or want to get involved, make sure you come to that session. And this is going to give that link for it. Um, uh, Thursday, uh, this Thursday, I'll be going through uh, Strategist Intensive um, through Leading Member Trusts and also SMSFs. Might, in fact, delay that, I think, because I've got a meeting with Tim Munro that I have to go to. So let, let me come back on that one. Uh, can you remind me, Chris, to make a change on that? Uh, next, oh, there you go, next week, perfect. Um, all you have to do is just register on that. Even if you can't uh, register there, even if you can't make the session, just register uh, because you're going to get the recording and all the materials anyway. So next week, we're going to rip into SMSF uh, wills. Week after that is uh, discretionary trust. Um, after that, we're going to look at uh, the business protector. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, actually, no, sorry, next week is the leading member trust. Um, and then um, how to do a uh, SMSF will. So we've got quite a lot there. Uh, strategy solution, um, business protector, that's awesome. So restructuring businesses completely. Uh, like your sweater company, successor director, so on and so forth. So if you want to go in, jump in there, that'd be fantastic. You know, I've taken enough of your time. Thank you very much for that session. It was entertaining. There was a lot of strategies there. They're my ones I love. Um, and again, there's a couple other ones um, that I, I love even further, but they're just a bit more complex um, in an hour to really go through. But if you come to my three-day session, um, you'll love it and we'll get into all of that. Anyway, Brian Abbott signing off and thank you all for coming to today's session.